You're watching Maverick Media. Educate, organize, act. government or the CIA has been involved in overthrowing countries uh, that, that uh, were in support of us putting in puppet governments, uh, pu puppet leaders, or really supporting dictatorships? Well, the United States, uh, I know mo mostly going back to World War II, I mean, I'm sure it's happened before that, but uh, since, the, since the Central Intelligence Agency was founded in 47, this has been a regular part of uh, U.S. foreign policy, a covert part, most often, um, but something that uh, that American leaders have liked. That if the if uh, compliant leaders can be put in power in different countries, that's what the United States tries to do. Uh, and they may be uh, for geopolitical reasons, maybe for economic reasons. And sometimes those people are very have been very bad people. The uh, for instance in Guatemala, the uh, the United States also going back to 54, by the same time as the Iranian operation, uh, overthrew the Arbenz government, another elected government, and began a pattern of having military dictators in control in Guatemala. And increasingly, it became bloodier and bloodier and bloodier. Ultimately, a couple hundred thousand Guatemalans were put to death in, in this effort to keep these pro-U.S. governments in power. It got so bad under under uh, under Reagan uh, that the uh, the bloodshed became uh, was was just extraordinary. The um, uh, there was a, a, a leader took power named Rios Montt, who was supposedly a fundamentalist Christian, and he unleashed um, this uh, scorched earth policy in the highlands, uh, and Reagan covered up for him. Reagan uh, said that he that Rios Montt was getting a bum rap when. Human rights groups said that he was engaged in these mass uh, mass extermination campaigns. Ultimately, after the uh, by the time we get to the late 90s, when some of the documents were released by the Clinton administration, they were provided to a, a truth commission in Guatemala, which went through this material and released it to the public, and um, showing that 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 genocide was being committed against Indian tribes in the highlands of uh, Guatemala, and the U.S. was was complicit. And this is not some ancient thing or some distant thing like uh, the 19th century. This was stuff that was, had just occurred essentially a decade or so earlier, um, yet it received almost no attention in the American press. It was a one-day story. It, it appeared in the New York Times and the Washington Post and, um, and then disappeared. Uh, it was not the kind of thing that, it, that the thinking was, in the, I think, in probably the media was, this is not the kind of thing Americans want to hear about themselves, about their country. So it was. It was. It became. You know, down, it went went down the memory hole very quickly. You, you said something earlier uh, that the neocons had formed way back. Was it the 1970s? And we're seeing uh, a real um, influence by that sector of our government now on our whole country and our whole foreign policy, aren't we? Well, the neoconservatives were a movement uh, that came that in some cases sprung from the American left. There was the Trotskyite connection. There was there was this, these bitter splits in the American left going back a number of decades, and uh, the neocons uh, sort of took the very worst aspects of some of the of the leftist infighting. But they were extremely they're well educated, they're well educated, and they have uh, 
Um, they, they are well connected and they proceeded to, to engage in efforts to control information. The neocons understood the power of information, or often in their case, disinformation. Uh, they had a phrase they liked to use when they were sort of moving into positions of power in, under Reagan in the 1980s they called perception management. And they understood that, that they could manage the perceptions of the American people. They could get the American people to do pretty much what they wanted. And the main way they would do that is to scare the American people. They would exaggerate threats. They would, you know, they, well, back in the 70s, back at the time of Team B, uh, where Paul Wolfowitz was, was working with his, these old uh, Cold Warriors, uh, examining the, the power of the Soviet Union, the idea was to make the Soviet Union much more scary, much, much more dangerous than it actually was. Uh, they used the same tactics. Many of, the, many of the neocons moved over to Central America under Reagan, because Reagan did not really give them much say in the Middle East. The Middle East was considered places for more adult people like James Baker, Philip Habib, but the neocons were allowed to cut their teeth, if you will, on Central America. And you had people like Elliot Abrams, who was put in as Assistant Secretary of State. Robert Kagan was, was put into the Office of Public Diplomacy for Central America. You had, uh, so these key figures were getting, learning how to play these games, and part of what they did was how do you make Central America something that the American people will want to side with these repressive policies in, uh, in, in countries controlled by right-wing dictators like Guatemala, and how do you get them scared of the Sandinistas in Nicaragua enough to support the Contras? So they, they developed themes. Uh, they had one called the Feet People, and it was that if we don't go in there and, 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 and get rid of the Sandinistas, there will be Feet People flowing into the United States, and they'll be flooding Texas, and, uh, and we don't want that to happen, these you know, Central Americans being allowed to come up. Ironically, um, not only was, the, was, the, was it offensive, that kind of theme, but it was also wrong. I mean, the, the, the greatest number of feet people, or, or uh, immigrants, people, refugees fleeing the violence, were fleeing from El Salvador and Guatemala and places where the U.S.-backed governments were carrying out these atrocities. And they were fleeing the violence. And that didn't happen in Nicaragua for quite a while. Uh, later on, when the Contra War be was being increased, you saw more of that. But people, you know, people are like most people. They will flee violence and they will try to save themselves and their families. So, but what, so in other words, the United States was actually creating the problem that the neocons were claiming would result if the United States didn't intervene militarily in, in the way we were, the way the Reagan administration was in Central America. So you had these, but it was always this idea, can you scare the American people enough? And that's what the neocons mastered. And when, and when they came back to power under George W. Bush, and they were given control of the Middle East, Elliot Abrams became a, the National Security Council official in charge of the Middle East. And so we see the same games that were replayed. Um, now we have to show how, how scary is Iraq. Iraq's going to attack the United States. There was one of my favorite ones they used was that Saddam had these little basically model planes that uh, remote control planes and somehow that those planes are supposed to fly over to the United States and spray us with, with biological weapons. It made no sense. But, but the kind of scary tactics they were using didn't really have to. Uh, it, was, it played on a psychological level. Um, and obviously they, the biggest thing they did was to play up the, the false stories about WMD and the false stories about ties to Al-Qaeda and the false stories about Saddam being involved in 9-11, et cetera, et cetera. So you had this, this, this manipulation of information again. And Americans, to a great extent, bought it because that's what they heard. And if they weren't hearing it from the mainstream press, and they were hearing it a good deal from the mainstream press, the New York Times, for instance, the Washington Post were both deep into putting out this kind of nonsense, they would hear it from the right-wing press. They'd hear it on the talk radio shows. So Americans were essentially being propagandized about with these fears and, and, and these false dangers. Um, and just like the neocons understood, if you control the perceptions of the American people, if you manage those, you can manage the American people. And terrorism is the biggest uh, fear driving uh, Americans now in our foreign policy. Sure. I mean, they, and you know, terrorism obviously was a factor going back. I mean, it wasn't new after 9-11. Uh, Reagan had declared in 1980 and 81 that terrorism would replace human rights as, the, as a leading interest of the United States government. Um, but, and, and much of what happened in the 1980s was around terrorism. Uh, they can the the some of the some of the some of the guerrilla warfare in Central America the from the left side was denounced as terrorism. 
Obviously, there were um, uh, militant Arab groups operating in the Middle East that were involved in terrorism, and, and that was a factor. But uh, the 9-11 attacks with the, the 3,000 dead and the dramatic effects, that led, uh, that certainly um, made the fears much more real for the American people, and, and, and not only played on their fears, but their sense of revenge. And then you simply had to give targets for that revenge. Initially, the targets were Al-Qaeda, which made some sense since they were involved in carrying out the attacks, and, and Afghanistan, where they were being harbored, supposedly. But um, then it had to spread because the neocons' real target was Iraq, and ultimately Iran and Syria. Those were, the, those were at the top of the real list of countries to have regime change. Um, and those were the countries that were considered the biggest threats to Israel. Um, and the neocons wanted to make sure those countries were, th were thwarted in their ability to project any kinds of power. Uh, and the real goal was then to get, to, to wipe out the, the supporters of Hamas and Hezbollah, uh, the frontline groups that Israel was concerned about. And if you took down Iraq, if you took down Syria and Iran, that supposedly would force the Palestinians to accept whatever terms the Israelis wanted to dictate. And that was the, that was the behind the scenes thinking of the neocons and, on how they were gonna make this all work. Would you say Robert Gates is a neocon? No, I would say Robert Gates um, is a mix of things. There may be some neocon in there. Robert Gates was an important figure in all of this um, because he was this young aspiring CIA analyst, supposedly, but more of a politician. He worked at the National Security Council staff and during that late 70s period. So, so Robert Gates then is, is, he's one of the guys implicated in the October surprise uh, dealings, uh, according to witnesses and, the, and even the Russian report that was delivered to the House in, uh, in early 93, Gates was, it was, was involved in these meetings with the Iranians on behalf of the Reagan campaign. Uh, so uh, whether one wants to believe that or not, and it's obviously been denied, but there's evidence to support it, sort of that gray area. But Gates certainly, his career took off like a meteor after, after Reagan came in and Bill Casey became director of central intelligence. Gates's big role, though, was he was, a, he was more of a careerist, opportunist. He was put in charge of the, of the analytical division. And the analytical division was very important at CIA because it had this history of sort of telling, as best it could, the policymakers what the facts were. Again, information is crucial to neocons, how you control that. So, so Gates's job was essentially to break the independence of the analytical division to replace it with people who would give Reagan and later the Bushes the intelligence they wanted. Um, and in Washington, uh, I'll say a leaked CIA report, an analytical report, is very powerful in terms of information. Uh, so if you could control or make sure that nothing negative comes out that you don't want, and maybe make sure that something positive that you do want, for instance, you know, take us to the 2002 NIE on Iraq, if you make sure that one says, all the good stuff, yes, yeah, Saddam's up to his eyeballs and WMB, et cetera. That's a very powerful tool, if you can get that document. So it was important to control the CIA analysts. And so many of the, of the traditional honest analysts were purged or pushed aside during this period of the 1980s. Essentially, the independence of the CIA's analytical division was broken. Gates was the guy who broke it. And this became an issue uh, for him when he was nominated by Bush the first time in uh, 91 to be CIA director in a remarkable development. Many of these old analysts went before the Senate Intelligence Committee and said that Gates had politicized the intelligence product. And uh, that caused, and, and, uh, and despite that, because uh, David Bourne, Senator Bourne, was a friend of Gates. Uh, he was the Democratic chairman of the committee. And his, and his top aide, by the way, his, his, his senior aide handling the investigation was a guy named George Tenet. And they basically greased the skids to get Gates through as CIA director. So he was made uh, director in 91. Um, and we remained there until the end of uh, Bush's presidency. Clinton, Clinton did not um, renominate him. He was then, uh, there, he was replaced, although Clinton's people weren't much better. The, um, and Gates then wandered off in kind of a, um, without much work to do. He, he sort of wrote his memoirs and then he, and then uh, the elder Bush got him a job at, uh, uh, in Texas as a, as a college president. 
And there he sort of was stuck until um, Bush, he was, he was brought on to the, uh, to the Iran, the, the, sorry, the Iraq study group, and Bush reached out to him, the younger Bush reached out to him in 2006 to replace Rumsfeld. And people mis misinterpreted what happened there. The, the, the general consensus, even among Democrats, was that Gates represented the, 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 the side that wanted to bring the Iraq war to an end, and that Rumsfeld was this sort of crazy cowboy. The truth was the opposite. Rumsfeld wanted to minimize the U.S. military occupation of Iraq. He wanted to get the U.S. out. He was talking about a withdrawal plan in 2007. He sent a memo to Bush to this effect. Bush immediately fired him, and he reached out to Gates because Gates was willing to play ball and keep the, keep the war going. Uh, so basically everyone got it wrong at that time. Uh, the interpretation was the opposite of the truth. And, he, and Gates was welcomed before the... Um, the, uh, the, House, the Senate Armed Services Committee, people like Senator Clinton praised him. Um, there was this thought that he was going to bring reason to the Bush administration. In term, in, instead, he, was be, he became sort of the, the, a great promoter of the surge and of a, an escalation of the war in Iraq, not a de-escalation. Um, what would you say about where we are right now? Uh, we've got Obama, we're going into Afghanistan, uh, we're increasing our troop level in Afghanistan, we've got McChrystal, we've got uh, Gates pushing uh, to uh, amplify the situation there. Well, how would you characterize this? Would it be fair to say, for example, that the United States has become an empire? Well, I, mean, I think there's no question that the United States has many of the trappings of an empire. I mean, there are U.S. bases all over the world. Uh, US, U.S. military intervenes more than any other military uh, in, in the world. Uh, the U.S. Can, feels like can invade countries and in defiance of the U.N., in defiance of the Nuremberg Principles, in defiance of the Geneva Conventions. Uh, the U.S. talks about its exceptionalism, which basically means that it can do what it wants because it supposedly is so morally superior to everybody else. That's, um, that's almost stated by, by the people who promote this, that the U.S. should intervene in all these countries. So I think to suggest it's an empire is not, it's really off the mark. The bigger problem, I think, though, is that it's very difficult for p politicians at this point to rein it in. And even if you wanted to, even if, say, President Obama really is uncomfortable with uh, continuing some of these Bush policies, uh, and I think one can argue that he should have done a lot more to both, both hold the Bush people accountable for their crimes of torture and and war crimes uh, than he has. He hasn't done anything. In fact, he wants to look forward, not backwards. And you could say that he probably, maybe he should have been more aggressive in, in, uh, in, in ending the Iraq war. He's sort of put that on a continuing basis to phase the U.S. out. In Afghanistan, he's escalated. You could certainly fault all those points. However, I think from in a realistic point of view, uh, it is very difficult for a politician to just go against all the forces that are now arrayed uh, inside the United States to keep this ball rolling, to keep the military industrial complex funded, to, um, to not uh, run afoul of this very powerful right-wing media apparatus. Now, I think it's sort of a fool's errand for someone like Obama to try to finesse that. They're gonna attack him whatever he does. Uh, they might attack him more and more aggressively if he were to try to end the war in Afghanistan, say. They would call him a traitor. They would call him, you know, pro-Muslim or, you know, communist. Whatever they would think of, they would call him that, and it would. And he probably would have a lot of political trouble for doing it. Uh, that doesn't mean he shouldn't do it. I'm, I'm not saying that, but he would. He certainly was looking at that problem. On the other side, uh, the American people are part of the problem too. Uh, the progressive community has never rallied in the way it, it could have or should have to build a movement, build institutions, media institutions, think tanks, et cetera, to challenge what the right has built. The right has this enormous vertically integrated apparatus that runs from book publishing, magazines, newspapers, uh, radio, television, the internet. They, are, they fund it with billions of dollars. On the other hand, the progressives just don't really want to do that much. I mean, there are people that do things as best they can but there's been no real big investment in this. So you've got politicians who have to somehow, they think they have to navigate these, these very unfavorable waters. Uh, and so they try to finesse, they try to make deals, and they try to do what they have to to survive in their view. 
And that has other consequences. It demoralizes the, the, the people that elected them. People say, well, why do we vote for you if you're going to do the same thing they, the Republicans did? Uh, so it, so it, in effect, it puts these politicians like Obama in kind of a no-win situation. They can try to be responsible. They can try to bail out the banks because uh, all the crazy Reagan, Bush policies have, and Clinton policies too, uh, in terms of deregulating the banks and deregulating industry, that those things are coming home to roost now. And, and all the tax cuts that have been passed in these years are, are, have created this huge federal deficit. So Obama has, he may wants to be responsible, he's trying to make deals and make compromises. And uh, while I think he's made some very bad choices, I also think we all have to take responsibility as citizens of this country for not making it more possible for politicians to do the right thing. It's easy to condemn them and criticize them. It's much harder to create this, the, the environment where they feel safer in doing the right thing. Same with, same with journalists. I must say, you know, I've been in the mainstream media for a lot of years. The idea of, of telling the truth and doing those stories that people say they want and then getting your brains beaten in for it, maybe losing your job or losing your status within your profession is a very high price to pay. And you don't get a sense that there's really much, um, there's not much out there for you if, if you do it. I mean, if someone like a, a Ray Bonner has to go find freelance work after the news of the New York Times, Gary Webb, uh, after he did that heroic stuff he did on, on contra drug trafficking in, the, in 96, he's humiliated, he loses his job, loses his family, and ultimately facing eviction from his, the place he was living, he kills himself. I mean, so you have real consequences for real people that could be different. And so I think, so I, my only point is I think, well, yes, we all have to criticize politicians for making choices that are uh, either improper or, or stupid. Um, we also have to take responsibility as citizens for leaving them sometimes with a sense that that's the best they have, those are the best options they see for themselves. In talking about one of the major things that Obama's done in terms of going into Afghanistan, we have Karzai, uh, we have ourselves uh, uh, allying with people like Rashid Dostam, who uh, I don't know the American people know very much about the Afghan massacre, uh, but could you just talk a little bit about Afghanistan and what we're going to be doing now? Well, Afghanistan is one of the great messes of, um, is, Afghanistan is one of the great messes of, of modern U.S. policies, and it goes back to the same time frame we've talked about. Obviously, the Soviets invaded Afghanistan or went into Afghanistan to support a, a communist government in, in 79 and 80. Uh, Carter tried to react to that. Um, uh, his national security advisor, Brzezinski, was pretty a, much a cold warrior and, and, and started the ball toward uh, the United States uh, countering that. Realistically, however, uh, as much as one might find the communist government repulsive in many ways, it, was, it actually tried to do many good things, especially for women. It tried to bring modern reforms to the country. It had, wanted to have schooling for women. Women could dress as they wished under the communist government. The United States effectively decided that in this effort to this Cold War, uh, I would say even though the Cold War was effectively over by then, it was over in the 70s, by, according to the early those CIA reports, the, the, that by the time you get to this period, there was a desire on the Reagan people to, uh, to ratchet up the Cold War again. So a whole bunch of decisions were made that, were, that really had terrible consequences. The Reagan administration wanted to teach the Soviets a lesson. Uh, so they, they started playing to the Islamic extremism. Uh, at CIA, they were publishing uh, Korans that were being distributed. And not just for Afghanistan, they were, they were using the same basic strategy in the southern Soviet Union where the, where the so-called stand countries now are, to sort of ratchet up the, um, this Islamic fervor as a way to undermine the Soviets. So much of this was sort of stirred up by the United States for this, sort of, this, this rather odd idea of, of somehow taking back Afghanistan, a country that really didn't have much strategic value to us, or anybody particularly. So, so you had, so, so then that required also dealing with the Pakistanis and, and Pakistani intelligence, the ISI. These are very unsavory people too. And they were, they were building an atomic bomb secretly. So as part of the deal, what Reagan did was he agreed to essentially turn a blind eye to the Pakistani nuclear program in exchange for them providing weapons to these Islamic extremists who the United States was supporting in Afghanistan. 
And there are also, of course, other um, uh, Islamic extremists from other countries that rallied to that cause, including Osama bin Laden and some of the people that later became Al Qaeda. So you had, we had the United States helping to fund some of these very extreme characters, very violent characters, people that engage in terrorism. That was the, what Reagan thought was a good idea. He also agreed to, to protect the Pakistani nuclear program so they could develop a nuclear bomb. That's what they wanted. So we ended up with a situation that, yes, the Soviets were ultimately driven out of Afghanistan in 1989, um, uh, but uh, what was also left in play were all these warlords that you talked about and, the, and these religious extremists being supported by uh, the, is, the Islamic government of Pakistan, which was getting closer and closer to a nuclear bomb. Now the, so all this may sound like crazy, but that's what the US policy was. Um, anyway, so you get the, so at, at the end of the day, you get the, um, uh, actually in 88, um, uh, President Gorbachev of the Soviet Union has another plan he wants us to give the Americans. He says, listen, we'll pull out, and then we have, our, we have the, the, old, the communist government of Najibullah in place, and we'll have a coalition with some of the better people from your side, some of the less extreme Islamists, and we'll have a coalition government and bring peace to Afghanistan as best we can. The United States rejected that. I was at, I was at Newsweek at the time, and I was covering this stuff, and I, talk, I was talking to one uh, CIA guy who was involved in this program, and I said, why don't you, why don't we just take the deal? I mean, the Russians have left, just, you know, why not just have a, settle this thing? And the guy said, in disgust toward me, he said, we want to see Najibullah strung up by a light pole. And I couldn't figure out why Najibullah was that important, frankly. He was just this guy that was running Afghanistan at the time. Now, the thinking was that the U.S. would be able to continue the support through the CIA for these rebels. Najibullah would be swept from power, and the U.S. back guys would take power in, say, 1990. The trouble was that Najibullah was sort of made of sterner stuff. And so he was able to thwart the takeover. So the war continues. And, and contrary to Charlie Wilson's war and the, the myths that have been created about that, the U.S. does not just abandon the, 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 uh, the Mujahideen immediately after the Soviets leave. The U.S. continues to support them through the CIA for another two or three years until the Soviet Union actually dis ends, which is in 1991, and then basically uh, both now Russia and the U.S. step back. But the war, can, the, the, but the war doesn't end either. Eventually, another a more mo moderate Islamic group takes over. Najibullah remains alive, remains in Kabul. Uh, it, it, this thing continues. And finally, the, um, the Pakistanis organize a group of, of students, Afghan refugees, and train them in Islamic theories and the thought. And this group is called the Taliban. And, the, and then the ISI in Pakistan send them into Afghanistan with, the, with Pakistani support with the promise that they're going to bring order to the country and they drive out the more moderate Islamic group that was in Kabul. Um, they take over. Uh, Najibullah tries to escape. He, try, or he tries to run to the UN compound. They catch him. They torture him. They castrate him. And they string him up by a light pole. Ironically, just what the CIA guy was envisioning years earlier. But by now it's 1996, and this country's a wreck at this point. The, all the middle class essentially has been destroyed. All the people that could provide a, a, some kind of reasonable government, gone. And, and, and because there was this, uh, this, 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 what the Taliban actually provided was not just security, they, they, brought the, they wanted to bring the country back to the seventh century AD. So you had this very backward group that that put women especially under, under this horrible control. Um, and that was really all essentially brought to you by the US government policies. These were misguided policies driven by other agendas. Um, Afghanistan was essentially a sideshow the, at the end of the Cold War, but it was one that had horrible consequences uh, that are playing out to this day. They, obviously, you have the one being that the, these Islamic extremists uh, around uh, uh, bin Laden coalesced into Al-Qaeda and then began attacking U.S. targets in Africa and elsewhere, trying to drive the United States out of the region, and that ultimately leads to the 9-11 attacks. 
So you have this, um, you have this extraordinary case of, of, of policies that were short-sighted, having long-term horrible consequences. Can you say anything about the Karzai government? Well, the Karzai government, um, which was put in power by the United States after, after uh, the Bush administration invaded um, Afghanistan in late 2001, is like so many of these places, uh, many of these governments. It was a compliant leader who um, had very corrupt connections, uh, who was making deals with the warlords, um, with, with heroin being a major source of money for all sides in this conflict. Um, uh, Karzai's brother has been implicated in the drug trade. I, I don't personally know all the details. I've not investigated that myself, but it has been widely reported that uh, people high up in the Karzai government are, are involved in the drug trade. And because of their, uh, the need for them, much like with the Contras back in the 1980s when Reagan felt he needed the Contras uh, in his Nicaragua operation, the, uh, the Karzai government has a special standing. The United States sort of needs that government to somehow succeed or at least not be replaced or overthrown for the policies to work. The trouble is you've got a very corrupt government that uh, the United States is in bed with. And that's what, when you look at what Ambassador Eikenberry recently uh, cabled to President Obama saying this policy is not going to work in terms of trying to um, expand the war because the Karzai government is not a responsible partner. And, and, and Eikenberry is correct. You know, whether or not somehow it can be transformed into one is, I guess, an open question. But uh, over the past uh, eight years or so, it certainly has, has shown itself to be incompetent and, and corrupt. In terms of the American government, we, we see the change constantly. We're always voting for new senators, House of Representatives, a new president. But the policies of the country continue to depend without, uh, without regard, it seems almost, uh, to who's in Congress. We still keep uh, going into these wars, occupations, uh, global domination is what it appears to be, control of resources. Uh, is there a power that you see that might be ongoing? I mean, I guess what I'm suggesting here is that the CIA keeps going on, we don't vote for them. Uh, the corporations keep going on, we don't vote for them. Um, but the people that we do vote for seem to be rather ineffective in stopping the way things are going. So is there some sort of power behind what we are seeing as American citizens? Well, I think it's not necessarily all that hidden. Uh, we have the, or, the, the right wing and the conservatives have, very, have organized brilliantly. They have spent tens of billions of dollars on, on building an infrastructure to support what the, many of the corporations want to do, whether it's deregulation, so they support libertarian causes, whether it's uh, military industrial complex, so you have these think tanks like Heritage or AEI that get well funded. There's all this effort to, to control the, the messaging, control the, the so-called so war of ideas. And, and the right has made that a huge investment. And, and, and because of that, a lot of policies have been implemented. Uh, Reagan used to say that the real problem was government. Uh, and in other words, um, I would argue that the only way to check corporate power in America is to have a democratized and energized federal government that can do it. Uh, which requires a lot of support from the public in the sense of being democratized. If, if that's off the table, that means corporations basically dictate everything in our lives. And we are left to negotiate every little intimate detail, whether it's your health insurance, why don't you just sort of negotiate with your health insurance provider? Or why don't you negotiate even with your cable television provider? Or, you, you have to, or your, your employer, and unions have been broken. Uh, and that was another big thing Reagan uh, worked on in the early part of his presidency. So all of us are sort of left atomized, alone. And this is what even the, the Tea Partiers kind of, the, the sort of re, the ridiculous aspect of them is that here these are sort of average people, let's say, who probably don't have health care or very good health care, probably they're being screwed on the job, and their, and their anger is directed against the government, not against the corporations, not against the people that are actually making their lives more miserable. So, so, that's, so there's been this delusion that has, that has really come to dominate the American political system. And information has been the key from the beginning 
the ability to develop it honestly and with rigor and get it to the American people so they can be informed and therefore empowered. That's what the neocons and that's what the right went after, the influence of information. And so we, from the point of the time of the American people being very energized and active in the late 60s and early 70s, with the media you know, doing a much better job in terms of telling the, getting out the secrets and telling the public what was going on, to today is like, is like really night and day. And, 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 and that's why I think the, um, I'm not sure where you start to try to solve the problem, because it's now so deep, you know, it's so systemic. But I would argue that there has to be a major effort made in media and the ability to get facts to the American people and, and in a consistent way, not just periodically, not just sporadically, but consistently. And, and somehow get back to that period when the American people are energized and informed and active. And that, I think, might allow a well-meaning politician, let's assume for a second that President Obama is such a person, that would give them a better chance to do the right thing and succeed, rather than if they do the right thing, getting crushed, uh, or making a deal, making some kind of compromise that leads them into a direction that everyone says, why do we vote for the guy? And, and I think that's the problem, and I, if there's an answer, I think one has to begin by getting back to the ability to tell the truth. Consortium News, that's your outlet. Tell us about Consortium News and your, well, your website. Well, basically, um, Quick story about Consortium News. I'd come out of the Associated Press, Newsweek, and done work with PBS Frontline. And it, by the mid-1990s, it was very clear to me that there was really no way to work within the mainstream media in any consistent way to get the truth out in, on these difficult issues. Um, the system had become rigged. And it wasn't just the right-wing press anymore. Uh, it was the New York Times, the Washington Post. They had basically surrendered their commitment to get anything out that the government really didn't want. They might deal with personal indiscretions, but on the big stories, they were AWOL. So, uh, and this goes to when I discovered those documents uh, in the ladies' room, the, the October Surprise documents, and I put them together. I thought this was really exciting. I, got, I wrote up a report about it and um, tried to sort of get some places like The New Yorker, you know, more liberal kinds of publications to run it. No one was interested. This was the mid-90s. No one thought that, who cared about that stuff? Plus, it had been, hadn't that been discredited? It was that kind of attitude. So I was sitting there kind of frustrated. My, and my, young, my oldest son, Sam, had just finished college. And he said, well, Dad, instead of complaining, you know, there's this thing called the internet. I said, really? And he said, there's things called, you can set up something called a website. And so I said, well, okay, let's see what we can do. And, and back then there were no templates for websites. Sam, who wasn't really experienced with this, had to like figure out how to build a website. So he mastered that and we, and our first series was an eight part series about these documents. These, and we, we put some of them up, they're on the available on the internet. Some are top secret, some are secret, and some are just classified. But they tell this remarkable tale um, and so I thought, well, maybe we could try this. And I, I also thought it was a way to convince people that you could do serious journalism and not cost an arm and a leg. You know, one of the complaints I'd hear from, from wealthy liberals was, oh, your media is too expensive, we can't possibly do that. We don't want to waste our money on that. So I thought maybe this was a way to uh, convince people that you could do good stuff and it wouldn't cost an arm and a leg. Uh, you could just put more of the money into the actual reporting and writing and, and less into the production side. Um, that turned out to be true, except it, I never was able to convince uh, the people with money that this was worth supporting in any meaningful way. So we struggled along. We kept doing really good stuff. Uh, by 2000 or so, I'd run out of money. And, um, and just as the campaign was going on, between, starting with between Gore and Bush, I, w I made a last pitch to a wealthy funder. and I said, you know, this is really important to because Gore's his words are being misrepresented. It's not just by the right. The New York Times and the Washington Post are making up quotes for him. That this, is, you know, this is going to be devastating. And the guy said, oh, no, there's no way Bush will become president. We don't have to worry about that. Uh, we'll just, we're going to spend our money, he said, uh, on setting up groups to pressure President Gore. And at that point, I kind of threw my hands up. Uh, I was, I'd often been, it was a job I had open at uh, Bloomberg News which would pay me six figures, and I needed the money. So I kind of put the website on kind of a part-time basis. We kept it alive. I'd get up at four in the morning or work on weekends to sort of get some stories up. 
But we didn't do nearly as much as we should have in the 2000 election year. Um, and I was pretty busy. I, I was handling securities regulation editing for Bloomberg, which was at that time because of the, uh, the dot-com bus was a very busy beat. Anyway, so, um, so for four years, I just sort of continued doing the best we could and I was working. And, and then in 2004, I was approached by some liberals who said, no, people now get what you're saying. They would get it. Uh, these are folks who were involved in setting up Air America. And they said there would be money available for this. And I wasn't sure I believed them. Frankly, I didn't. But they seemed sincere. And I felt I needed to get this material together that I'd had on Bush's in a, in a different way. So I quit Bloomberg and left my six-figure job and uh, started to work on Secrecy and Privilege, which was my previous book to the last one, and um, which laid out a lot of what the Bush family, how they really had risen to power. Um, and we got that book out, you know, we had to do it sort of through our own publishing uh, arm. And um, we revived Consortium News and we began to expand it. Um, we obviously didn't have much effect on the 2004 election, at least, uh, you know, Bush got reelected. And the, um, uh, but we, can, we became a voice for serious reporting on these topics like Iraq. Um, like some of the human rights violations that were gone, the torture. And we began to assemble more and more good people, like people like Ray McGovern, former CIA people, who had experienced similar things to what, what I'd experienced as a journalist. They'd experienced inside the CIA's analytical division, the same pressure to falsify information and not tell the truth in a meaningful way. So we continued the website and we've uh, made it, we've gotten it through now 15 years. We were the first, therefore now the oldest, um, investigative news magazine on the internet. Um, and we've continued to try to tell the stories as best we can. We're, we do it with serious journalism. We don't go off on wild tangents. We, 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 we insist on facts and evidence. And we try to present it in ways that are very interesting to the American people. Um, so we're doing our part, not as much as we'd like to do, but we're doing our part. Thank you. Thank you, Robert Perry. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining Paul's TV. And please check out Consortium News. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. Thank you. Thank you.